everyone. Uh, my name is Christina Young, and uh, I've been on the pan cancer analysis of whole genome project for the last two years or so. So um, this is a large scale project that is um, a use case. You can consider it to be a use case for all the cloud computing basics that you've learned uh, over the last day and a half. And so this is a project where we utilized multiple cloud resources, not just one. We used actually 14 cloud resources to get this project done. And we, I'm going to show you uh, some of the obstacles, some of the challenges we have encountered, some, some of the lessons we have learned, uh, because the lessons learned are very valuable as we are only going to uh, get bigger and bigger with our data analysis. Um, there are also a lot of resources that came out of this project, whether you are a um, researcher, a bioinformatician, there's hopefully something that you will find useful uh, that we consider to be legacy data set or legacy anal analysis pipelines. So at the end of this, you will run one of the workflow, BWMM is an alignment workflow. Uh, typically it takes days to run, so that's why you would just run on a very small test data set just to get a, a, a flavor of it. So what is the pan cancer analysis of whole genomes? Uh, this project started out two and a half years ago with the goal to collect 2,000 whole genome uh, cancer, uh, for cancer patients. So we wanted tumor whole genome and also normal whole genome. So this is, uh, you can consider an extension of what TCGA has done for pan cancer exomes. So we made a call out to the ICGC members. Uh, we have very overwhelming response. We end up collecting over 2,800 uh, donors with whole genomes. And this is different uh, from the um, exomes because now you have data to look at non-coding regions, structural variations, and any pathogen insertions. But of course, we still are interested in any driver mutations, whether they're coding or non-coding, and also driving uh, driver pathways. So this project is organized uh, with a steering committee of five members from different uh, institutes, uh, from Gaddy, uh, from P Peter Campbell from Sanger, Gaddy Getz from Broad, Jan Kobel from Amble, Lincoln Stein, who's the director of bioinformatics uh, and uh, informatics and biocomputing here, and Josh Stewart over at UC Santa Cruz. So at the beginning, we also asked researchers to submit abstracts on what they would like to do with this data set. So we received 130 abstracts. And based on these abstracts, uh, 16 working groups were created uh, using the different scientific themes. And then there's also a technical working group, which I'm involved in. Um, we are responsible for aligning all the uh, genomes because one goal we want to make is a uniform alignment and also uniform variant calling. This will allow us to eliminate any variations that is because of different processing uh, pipelines. So these are the 16 working groups. Uh, you see, obviously, we have mutation calling at the top. That's very important for this project. We also have groups specialized in uh, looking at regulatory regions, transcriptomes. So transcriptome is another data set we do collect in this project. And we also have methylation data at the smaller scale, but it's still important to look at. And of course, we look at uh, driver pathways, uh, mutational signatures, and now we also can look at germline cancer genome uh, across these um, patients. So all in all is a, is a very interesting uh, set of questions, scientific questions to probe. And now these working groups are working hard uh, to try to make some discovery out of this data set. So out of these 2,800 donors, they are really collected from multiple projects. So as you can see, there, is, uh, there are a large number of co projects coming from the United States. These are actually from the TCGA projects that have whole genomes. And then we have other projects coming from Europe and uh, from Asia as well. So based on this map, we got to make our planning. How are we going to collect the data, right? Because uh, there's so much data, we cannot actually have just one center centralizing all the data. We need to distribute the data. And uh, this map actually helps us plan because obviously you need a server, a data center in Europe, in Asia, and also in North America. Uh, this bar chart just shows you the primary tumor sites that this project have data on. Um, each little color 
is actually a different project. So for example, in pancreas is actually, uh, we have four different projects contributing the pancreatic uh, um, endocrine tumor from the Italian group, from the Australian group, and we also have pancreas adenocarcinoma from the Australian group and also from Canada. So it's actually a mesh of projects uh, contributing to different primary sites. So the initial roadmap, as I said, was to collect 2,000 donors. That alone would give us gave us 600 terabytes of unlined BAM. So that's uh, quite a lot of data to handle. And we asked the data owner to submit this data uh, by giving us lame BAM levels. And it's very important right from the beginning that we establish the metadata that has to go with the data. Otherwise, it's just be a mess to track. So they found the metadata, they upload the BAMs, and they upload to a server called Genos. It's a gene torrent server. And the good thing about Genos, although they had a lot of technical problems, like uh, hung, <laughs> hung uploads, I know someone is laughing there because they have a bad experience. Your uploads will hang, it will uh, abort, you have to call the, contact the administrator to help you out. But it does have one advantage. It does validate your metadata. If it's not correct or matching, it will not accept your uh, submission. It also makes sure your file size, it does checksums, your file sizes, file names are everything as expected. So once it gets in, it's very useful to have all that metadata associated with um, the BAMs. So we uh, started off doing a, a alignment back in August uh, 2014. It took us about four months to align uh, the 2,000 donors. And then afterwards, we actually have a second train uh, to, uh, for people to uh, submit more data because they did not make it into the first train, but they wanted to be part of it. And that's why we got another additional 800 donors. So after the alignment phase, we have uh, three core varying calling pipelines, uh, one from Sanger, another one from DCAVS and Ombo, and a third one from Broad. Um, of course, at the time, there was question what, why these three pipelines uh, get to be the core, and why do we need three? Why can't we just do with one? It seemed like the decision was political at the time, but uh, when we looked at the validation, so on the right, this is our path to validate. Out of the 2,000 donors, we picked out 63 donors. Uh, they were picked because they had sufficient DNA for validation and also because of the material transfer agreement that a sample from one country can go to another country for sequencing. So with these 63 donors, we did the uh, deep targeted sequencing. It actually took nine months to do because it took time to uh, strategically pick up the variants for validation. You cannot validate every single one of them. So they need to be picked out. And then a panel was had to be designed. And it simply took four months to order a panel uh, before we can actually sequence in the lab and do the analysis and got the data back. Now, thankfully, after all that validation, we realized uh, the three core pipelines do perform much better than the other callers that participated in the validation phase. So we did have the three core pipelines correctly. And even better is that um, when we merge the calls from the three pipelines, we do have better accuracy than any of the uh, pipeline alone. So that's why we actually merged the calls from the three pipelines to get a consensus set that gives us very high uh, accuracy. So as I said, in the alignment phase, we had already 600 terabyte of raw data. It also gives us 600 terabyte of aligned data. Um, so we had to host this data in multiple sites. And also questions we had at the time also, well, if we align it at one time at one center, align a second time at another center, we would get the same results. And we did check, and we do. So in order to track this data, uh, we use Elasticsearch indexing. Uh, so this is uh, compiled every night so that we know where the data is, what state it is, it is in, whether it has been aligned or not aligned. Before we had Elasticsearch, uh, we had situations where some sample was aligned multiple times. And so you don't want that. That's just a waste of your compute. So to do this, we had seven data centers um, over at UCSC that at the NCI cluster at the time, it was hosting CG Hub. So all the TCGA data could only be hosted there. 
Uh, we also had a compute center at University of Chicago that protected data cloud. And then in Europe, we have three data centers, uh, EBI, Barcelona, and DKZ. George has a question. <clears throat> Uh huh. Yeah, and at those stacks, we have basically our tenancy, and we have accounts, and we can go in there, start VMs, and do any work that we need to do. Other places like University of Tokyo and uh, Barcelona, Barcelona is actually an HPC environment. In those environments, we don't even have accounts. So we only could give the software to the team over there, and they run it for us. They are our cloud shepherds, as we call them. Uh, yes? Are they all using Illumina? Uh they're all Illumina data, actually. Oh, okay. Yes. So they're, they're sort of unified with what happened. Yes. So it just so happened everyone was using Illumina, so we didn't have any issues with uh, different kind of data. Oh. Uh, so to do the alignment, we had, uh, at the time, we basically asked the data owners to upload the data to the local regions. So there's no overlapping of the data. And each center was just responsible for aligning the, the data at their own center. And this requires about, um, this requires an eight core machine, 16 gig RAM, about five days per sample. We had nearly 6,000 samples to align. So that's why it took that much resources and that much time. Uh, so as I said, it was done uh, within four months' time. The second train comes in with 800 donors. Um, that's okay. We, we knew how to do it all over. Uh, okay. that, was, it, that was easy. But then when it comes to varying calling, uh, it was actually a lot harder because, first of all, these pipelines were not just ready to go. They were running very well. They have been running very well in the local institute at Sanger and Broad. So for example, you know Broad has something called Firehose. This is sort of their orchestrator to run productions. And then they now have to take out the pieces, tear, tear it out from their uh, Firehose, and package it to run in another environment like OpenStack. So whenever when you try to move pieces of code like that, it Bugs are created. We're all human. So things are uh, not smooth at all. Uh, it takes a long time to put that code to a different environment. They all happen at different timings. And also, um, these pipelines are very specific to their own uh, sequencing centers. So for example, Sanger had a typical way of naming their uh, samples. Their tumors and normals are always named differently, but then when they run it on another center who happens to use the same names for the tumor and their normal uh, in the header, they run into issues. So this was a challenge for every uh, pipeline here because they are facing something that they've never seen before. Now, Broad also had pipelines that are completely new. They're not even published. So um, it was even cha more challenging to try to run these in a production environment when they may have to pull back and change the parameters. But the key, uh, key thing here is that more compute is required. Um, so here's actually a list of their algorithms if you're a biophematician and are curious about what, what was done. Um, in each of these pipelines we call uh, SNVs, uh, single nucleotide variants, indels, structural variants, copy number, germline. And so they all each have their own algorithm, uh, but all these they start off with is downloading the data from GNOS, and eventually they have to upload the data back to GNOS. So this is sort of what George uh, said before. You download the data when you need. When you're done, you upload it back then so you can kill, kill your instance uh, without having to save the data elsewhere. Now, these are core hours that were needed per donor. So 800 for Sanger, 800 for DGFZ, and 2300 for Broad. These are average numbers based on our runs on Amazon. And I'll tell you that. After running in so many environments, uh, Amazon typically gives us the best uh, performance. Uh, we don't know exactly why. Maybe they just have the latest CPUs, they have more optimized uh, I.O. network performance. Uh, so when you go to any other different environment, you, you would expect a slightly slower uh, runtime. 
Um, so we had a challenge also that back then that we didn't really know what these pipelines uh, need in terms of cores or memory. So there was a bit of trial and error. And like George said, the lesson is start small. Uh, you pick a different kind of samples, big and small, and try it out so you get a flavor of what exactly to do next when you try to scale up. So when we scaled up, uh, we actually went up to 14 compute resources. Uh, we're lucky in the sense that our uh, members volunteered additional compute resources, so such as iDash over at UCSD, uh, Sanger Institute, uh, um, and also even here at OICR, we added additional uh, compute resources. Uh, so here at OICR, we also have an open stack. And very importantly, there was a change in uh, policies. So for the longest time, we could not put TCGA data in the cloud. And then the policy changed. We're allowed to process TCGA data and also ICGC data in commercial clouds. And that's a big change. So that's why we started using Microsoft Azure uh, and also uh, Amazon Web Services. That really allows us to scale up, uh, even though it costs a bit, um, but that allows to really scale up and get resources when we need them. Uh, so where are we today? Uh, we have actually finished all our analysis, but as you can see, uh, we had that burst of BW alignment, and then the three core pipelines actually start at very uh, different times. And so that's why we had this uh, gradual flow of completion over two years' time. And we did some calculation. If we were to do this all over again, and if we managed to, say, start all three pipelines at the same time, what, uh, right after the alignment, we can possibly get this project done within four months, uh, provided that we can get all the compute needs that we can, so say at Amazon. So that's a very valuable lesson because um, it would be much faster if you want to do this all over again. Now, just to complete the story, um, core analysis is done, but it doesn't mean that the project is done for the data to be good. So in order to get good quality data, we actually get the calls out there to all the researchers, ask them to take a look, OK, where are the problems? What are some problematic donors? You don't expect every donor and every sample to be perfect. So with about three months of looking at the data, uh, they found that uh, we had to exclude 6% of the donors. Uh, sometimes it's the obvious reason that we don't have any uh, clinical information. Other times it's because we discovered that the tumor itself was contaminated with foreign DNA. Sometimes the normal that gets contaminated with the same donor's uh, tumor uh, DNA. And then there are cases where we see um, cDNA or mouse contamination. And also this exercise requires looking at a lot of uh, plots visually. And then based on visualization of structural variants, then some artifacts could be discovered. Um, so 6% being blacklisted, that's pretty normal, I think, for a project at this scale. And then we had another 2.6% of donors that have low-level contamination. We did manage to rescue them, we think, by filtering the contaminated calls, but it's never a complete uh, filtering. So we just flag them as ones that people have to pay attention when they do the analysis. So ultimately, we end up with 2,583 donors. And uh, some of them have multiple tumors. And then half of them have RNA-seq data to match with it. So this is a good resource uh, for anyone interested in large-scale um, analysis. Now, um, when I talked about filtering of, uh, of artifacts, there are actually multiple kind of artifacts that needs to be uh, filtered out. So there's oxidation. There is uh, PCR and strand bias. We also did um, non-robust mapping. What it, that means is we take the read and blot it against the reference. And if they map to a better, uh, re another region with a higher score than the one that was aligned to, then that read is out. And then we also build a panel of normals uh, using this cohort uh, in order to get rid of some of the false positives. And any SNVs that overlap with germlines or the thousand genome SNPs, those are filtered out. And in some small cases, we did have uh, calls on chromosome Y even in female donors. So those were filtered out as well. And other groups have looked at it and tried to look at annotation. So for example, the, we have a mutational signature group. They think certain things are um, artifacts. 
And also there's the observation that there are an enrichment of SNVs near indels. So that needs to be flagged in case someone found something interesting in those regions, they need to be aware that they could be artifacts. And then we provide other uh, estimates and ratings to help guide people uh, in their analysis. So now finishing the story is that using the consensus strategy, we managed to uh, get a very high precision and sensitivity for our SNB calls. And then for indels, as you know, indels are always hard to call. Um, if you overlap any two independent indel caller, the overlap is only 50%. So in this case, we did manage to get 90% precision, but of course, sensitivity is slightly lower at 60%. So any questions about the project at this point? OK. Then I'll talk about the lessons we have learned uh, from this project. These are more, um, I would say, technical implementations that we should do differently the next time. Um, so during this project, uh, the way that is done, we have 14 environments. but. All we have is actually something that is centralized metadata that we can look at to see what donor, uh, the, w whether the donor has gone through alignment or which pop variant calling pipeline has been done. And certain, if the pipeline has not been run, then OK. The project manager will tell uh, a specific compute center or a cloud shepherd uh, to run a variant pipeline on a specific sample. So this is where the project manager has to commu communicate to the Cloud Shepherd. Uh, we use Git to do, to do that, actually, to just put um, certain files or data in the Git so that the uh, Cloud Shepherd can go there and know which, which, one, uh, which donors to run through each pipeline. But the uh, monitoring is a bit scattered. So in order to know what's going on, project manager actually has to ask the Cloud Shepherd, hey, I haven't seen any uh, completion of donors over the last couple of days from your, your compute site. What's going on? Uh, so it was more of a, a human intervention in this case. Um, and so what I'll, I'll show you in a, in a couple of slides is the I, a better case that we can uh, automate these things and make it a lot easier, especially when you have multiple clouds to manage. Now, there is also the debate. Um, well, we have academic clouds. We have Amazon. Why don't we just stick with Amazon? You know, it's a lot easier. Or maybe let's just go with uh, academic clouds because it doesn't cost us anything. Well, there, I think we need both. Um, the reason is, sure, with academic clouds, you have like Collaboratory, for example. It's a low upfront uh, startup cost. So that's a good environment to start small and test and learn from it before you scale up. But also keep in mind, each environment is going to require at least a half uh, full-time employee as a cloud shepherd to monitor that site. So the more sites you have, the more FTU you're going to need, and salary costs as well, as well not just compute. Uh, the other reason, uh, the other cases where we cannot use academic is because one workflow, such as the Broad, actually requires a lot of resources. It required uh, 32 cores and 256 gig RAM. And very few institutes can give us a large number of VMs with that kind of resources. That's the, when we actually have to go to uh, Amazon and Microsoft Azure. OK, so well, what about we run on commercial clouds? Um, that's great, because you can start up really you know, a couple hundred of VMs with only half, a, half an FTE monitoring these jobs. So you can get a really a burst of uh, productivity there. However, there are some tricky things here. Uh, certain um, data cannot go on the cloud. So specifically, the German cohorts have told us that the data cannot be processed on any commercial clouds. They can only be processed in academic clouds. So that gave us a challenge as well. And also, uh, no. So I, I think it's both. A because most well, commercial clouds are all owned by you Amer Americans right now. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a bit of both. <laughs> That's right, yeah. 
Um, but if we run everything on commercial cloud, some of the donors will cost us a lot. Uh, they have run for over two months and even three months at a time, and you just wait and you don't know when it's going to finish. Uh, we're a little nervous about our cost at the time, but now we have learned. Uh, we can actually use BAM statistics uh, to predict which ones are going to be long running. And then we can save those for academic clouds and not pay for the long running time. Um, so as I said, metadata is key. Uh, our projects so far have only focused on whole genomes and RNA-seq, but more and more data are going to come online with by self seq um, And it's definitely important to establish the metadata right up front uh, when you start a large project like this. Now, during our projects, as you can imagine, we experience a number of outages at the data centers. Or like you said, sometimes you try to download from EBI, and but EBI is not available, and then your instance is just sitting there and waiting for that download to happen. So A, I think we need to do uh, replicate data to multiple data centers to have redundancy. And then next, we need to have a downloader that is smart enough that if it tries one data source, it doesn't work, go to a second data source, go to a third data source. And if all the, da all the data sources are, are not available, shut itself down, shut that instance down, and then notify the Cloud Shepherd. I'm having trouble downloading from all these uh, data centers. Is Maybe we can't run anything for a day or two. That, that has happened as well. Now. Also, we have crashes at some sites, unexpected, um, maybe power outage. But for whatever reason, um, we need some way to handle these crashes more gracefully. Because some cloud shoppers have actually spent you know, a good day just to clean up after a crash. So the queue can be cleaned up and then can um, go, to the, to go to the next job. So the queuing system needs to be uh, simpler, I hope, to, uh, for cleanup like that. And also, if we can have a queue that um, goes to multiple clouds, then if one queue, uh, one cloud doesn't work, then schedule it to another cloud. That would be very nice to have. And so, as I said, uh, we could be smarter uh, than we we did uh, during this project. So George has already showed you an example. Based on the size of your BAM file, choose your instance correctly right from the beginning. So in this project, uh, because of the way the queuing system was, uh, we always use the same instance size for every sample. And then so it might fail because it didn't have enough memory, enough disk space. That's something we could avoid by uh, choosing the right VM right from the beginning. Uh, so some kind of calculator would really help. And then we can also predict our long runners based on BAM stats. So that's important. Now, as I said, uh, cost of compute is typically a little lower than your FTE. So we try not to get uh, in a, a Cloud Shepherd to get involved with failed jobs. And so it would be nice if the queuing system is a little smarter. Yes, it start off with a good VM already. But if it, the job fails, maybe progressively try another VM that is larger with resources and try it again. Maybe try three times, and then eventually it does come back. Then the Cloud Shepherd can get hands on and look at why, what the problem is. And like George said, we need monitoring. So very good monitoring system uh, to tell you of any problem so you don't have to look at every single VM, VM to, to track, to find out if they're running or not. Because sometimes you have 100 running, and it's nice to know uh, to have a report that a VM has been idle for a couple hours already, report back alerts you so you know what it is doing because it's easy. We have had um, VMs sitting idle for days just because no one caught them. Um, last thing that, that may not be as, as uh, obvious is actually uh, to validate our results after uh, before submitting the data back to the GNOS, uh, back to the server. A lot of times we had good data done, but then we had cases, well, actually, uh, maybe a chromosome was missing. You know, those little things that we have all experienced but forgot to validate before um, uh, uploading the data back. So this is what I, I like to see as a project manager, right? Um, I like to just be able to have uh, one system, an orchestrator, that allows me to queue my jobs to multiple clouds. That gives me monitoring across multiple clouds, give me alerts. Because 
at some point, you can think of this actually as maybe even a grad student uh, who was doing a very large scale project. They got the DACO and DBGAP approval. They got a budget from a grant. Um, just orchestrate the work wherever is, pos uh, is possible. And then, of course, at the end, sometimes they get a bill back. But then now this is algorithm uh, pushing rather than pulling data into their local machines. They're just pushing the compute algorithms into the cloud that already has the data local to the system. So the, all this data moving should be avoided and should be make it easy uh, for one person to uh, compute across multiple clouds. So why are these lessons valuable? Uh, there are a couple projects probably coming up that will be uh, using large scale uh, analysis like this. So there's already a pan prostate initiative that's going to involve whole genomes, exomes, and other many other data types. The data is going to be in uh, US, Canada, UK, Germany, Australia. So again, this is very distributed. Um, actually, um, I forgot to tell you, for the Australian group, uh, when they participated in the Pan Cancer Project, the bandwidth was absolutely terrible. They couldn't even upload their data to any uh, servers. So they end up shipping us hard drives. We receive 40 pounds of hard drives and have to upload the data for them. Now, the good news is that there's now an AWS center in Australia. So hopefully that will solve the problem in the future. Another large-scale project is ICGC Med. Uh, this is an extension of ICGC that will include clinical trials and a lot more clinical information. Uh, the scale is going to be almost 100 times bigger than pan cancer. And the plan is to collect the raw data, do uniform alignment, do uniform variant calling. There will be multiple uh, data processing centers, you know, typically based on region again. And we'll be doing exactly what we've been doing for PanCan. So this time, the project is going to last 10 years. So you're not going to have a project manager who will be willing to sit there and, and assign workload on a daily basis. So all the things that I've just said needs to be really automated. And there needs to be some intelligent system to get the job done. Any questions about lessons? Eight years? Getting more aggressive. <laughs> All right. Sorry? We are just putting in a grant. Uh, yeah. So ICGC Met was started in 2018. So we have some time to put in the infrastructure and uh, getting the project ready. <laughs> okay, so after all this hard work from a lot of people, uh, what, what resources are available publicly to people, um, either now or very soon in the future? So of course data, people are going to care a lot about this cancer data. Um, methods. I mean, we put a lot of effort into uh, perfecting these methods, uh, gains validation data, so we'll share those two. And they're best, best practices that we have learned from this, uh, we have established in this project, and those needs to be shared as well. So first, to talk about data. Um, where can you find the data, right? Um, so if you're not familiar already, this is the ICGC data portal. It's at dcc.icgc.org. And this is a portal where you can find the data you're interested in. So in this case, um, so you see that on the left, there's a faceted search interface. So you can pick uh, the project you're interested in. So for example, these are all liver projects. Um, and so yeah, so liver got picked. And you can, it's, called, it's just like a shopping. You narrow down your data set that you're interested in. Uh, it shows here what your query you have been using so far. And then from here, if you click one of these uh, file ID, then you go to a page that will tell you a lot of details about this file. So in this case, this is a, a BAM file. And then it is actually available in multiple repositories that is listed here. So you see 
Peacock, um, I think this is Heidelberg, this is at Heidelberg, Barcelona, London, and also the data is in collaboratory as well. Um, so this gives you a choice of where to download your data, which we'll get into next. But if you click on this uh, BAM stats, you will see something like this. So this is actually a pretty cool tool uh, that Vincent Ferretti's team ha has used to give you real-time statistics of the BAM. So it's actually streaming the BAM. If you go to it, you, it will tell you the coverage. Uh, you can even zoom in on different chromosomes to get a sense of the coverage in those regions. It will give you all kinds of reads information as well. Um, so it's kind of cool. Um, there's another page, also a similar page for VCF that's being developed that you can uh, visualize your um, base changes or your variants along the chromosome. So this is being uh, developed right now. Uh, going back to the file page, yeah, Karina. No, you don't actually. This is just on the website. And the way that they have the security um, set up, it will not leak any specific uh, germline information. You can try it. <laughs> it went through a lot of security checks before this. So, um, no, so this is this one is will be individual, but they mask if it is a germline that is not the same as the reference, it gets ma masked. Yeah. So that's why you won't see any germline information that is identifiable. If you break it, let, let us know. <laughs> I always like breaking things. Um, okay, going back to the file page, there's another thing that you can click on, which is the metadata page. Uh, this is just tells you, you know, when this was generated, the kind of uh, specimen type. But this is sort of an example of the metadata that we keep track of. Now, this is uh, all open open data so you can look at it without uh, logging in or having any kind of account but there are there is data that requires authentication so if you already have a DACO application approved then you can log into the site and you see something like a token manager so this is where you can set your token to uh, in order to download from collaboratory because a lot of data is already in collaboratory or to download from AWS so yesterday when George asked you to try out the download, we didn't put, put any token in because you don't have DACO uh, authentication. And also we asked you to download data that was open access. That's why you did not need the token. So um, coming back to the page after you have the search results, you can download the data very easily by clicking a button called manifest. So everything that you have searched and select you're interested in, it would just come in a manifest uh, and you get an, um, so this is kind of what you, you will see at the beginning. It will show you, okay, you might start, so this is GIF, so it actually is a little video that repeats itself. But when you first start uh, with the manifest, it has actually over 1.5 petabyte of data if you download all of it because they're actually residing in multiple uh, repositories. Same files in multiple repos repositories because we have data redundancy. But it has a very smart feature that if you click this box called remove duplicate files, then it will decide uh, what to, the, it will remove the duplicate files for you based on the priority of repos you choose. So then that's why you can now move these repos uh, up or down so if there's one that you're specifically interested in, say collaboratory, you want to use that as your primary repo, move it to the top. So most of the files will be from collaboratory. The other files that collaboratory doesn't have, it will go to the next repo uh, to download. So this is a very smart tool and very useful, and you don't have to worry about um, um, removing duplicates and all. The other thing that you don't have to worry about uh, with this tool is where your data is coming from. So there's another new tool created by uh, this, this uh, Vincent's team is they call the ICGC get. 
is a universal tool you could be downloading from Amazon, from Collaboratory, from any of the GNOS servers, even from GDC, that is the new uh, Genomic Data Commons hosting all, all the NIH data. All of it, you can just put it in this ICGC get command, click, set, tells it to download, and then specify the manifest that you have just created previously. And this tool will just do everything for you. Otherwise, you will have to install different tools like GT download, um, also the ICGC storage client and other tools that are specific to the servers. Yeah, so the ICGC get will have a configuration file where you put your token, uh, your key as well in order to handle all of that. So this is a so ICGCG get is a universal tool, but the other tool that you tried yesterday was ICGC storage client. Now this tool is slightly is sort of um, slightly different because it's specific to collaboratory and AWS, and it also has additional features that ICGC get doesn't have. So downloading using a manifest, I already told you already. Uh, there's something that's interesting called BAM slicing. So instead of download the data and then use SAM tools to view a region, you can actually use this tool to just get a small region back and look at either through SAM tools um, or actually I haven't have tried IGV, but it would be nice to be able to see uh, small regions in uh, IGV as well. So you don't have to get a big file to your computer. Another nice feature is actually called manifest a uh, man, uh, fuse. So if some of you have worked with Fuse file system, you can actually mount um, a foreign drive onto your local computer, and it would just look like your own local drive. You can do ls, you can do du, all these commands. So this allows you to do that again. By giving it a manifest, you can mount all those files that you're interested in onto your own local drive, and now you can explore it. You can look at the files and, and see whether they, those are indeed what you're interested in. So that's very powerful. Uh, everything that I've just told you, you can definitely look at it uh, in more details at the user guide at uh, docs.icgc.org. Uh, it's very easy to follow uh, some of the commands to get download the data. Yes, Francis. Um, can you explain what the Yes. So as part of this project, we created mini BAMs that extract the reads flanking the variants. So it could be SNVs, indels, and structural variants. Only those relevant reads are pulled out. Um, and the mini BAMs will be available through the portal eventually. We haven't uploaded. Yeah, so for the entire project, if you look at the raw BAM, uh, the, the aligned BAMs, they're 800 terabytes in total. And then the mini BAMs comes down to only four terabytes. So it's half a percent of the original. So just the last couple of slides, I um, wanted to talk about the uh, workflows that we have. So when we started the project, uh, we didn't use Dockers. Um, back in 2014, it wasn't quite as hot. And then gradually, we shift, shift to Dockers. And also, we're now making all our workflows available as Dockers. So we want to make sure things are reproducible and uh, any other researchers can use the same algorithms. And they're specifically registered at docstore.org. So you ran the commands yesterday, it's a lot easier to just have a couple commands and look at the, uh, and describe the workflow in a uh, common workflow language. So we're gonna run one of them uh, at the lab. It's, um, so, so far, the BWMM is available through docstore and also the Sanger workflow DKFZ and Ombo workflow, those are all at DocStore now. We are going to get our uh, Broad pipeline in there as well. It's a little bit more complicated because there are a lot more components. Um, and you can search for the, the PCOG, you can search for P, the word string PCOG, and you'll find all the PCOG reports. Yeah. And then the other one that we are working on is actually all the filtering methods that we've used. Uh, it's easy to ignore the filtering methods, but 
as someone said, that's actually the secret sauce to get really good data. And a lot of it actually came from the Broad team. And for the longest time, they kept it a secret. And now they're sharing with the community. So it's, it's a very good thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So lastly, there are some best practices that have been established by this project. Uh, so for example, even just looking at your data and to determine whether it's good or bad is, is an art. Uh, so we will put together a Rhodes gallery of sequencing artifacts. We want to show some plots. They could be rainfall plots, IGV, uh, anything from uh, that help us identify problematic samples. We want to illustrate those examples uh, with the community. And like I said, the code for filtering out uh, the artifacts will also be made available. Or in other words, this session is called the Game of Bastille. <laughs> <laughs> is that politically correct? <laughs> no. So what I'm mentioning is now stopping the slide. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the lecture part is actually over. Uh, oh, I don't know why that looks like that. But uh, yeah, so we'll come back and do the lab uh, after lunch. Any questions? Yes. That's a general question. So you say you tried to align the, all the data using pipeline, yep. but they were prepared at a different size. So do you have like lab admin perhaps like that? Or? So definitely, uh, we definitely have library effects. Um, so one that we famously call the Sanger effect. Uh, the Sanger knew that their library preparation has certain um, uh, con uh, mutation context that are in high demand. So they filter those out and other sense. So we actually have to do those kind of filtering afterwards. Um, and as we go, we see other uh, effects that is specific to centers. But we haven't got the really um, systematic analysis by sequencing centers. It's definitely on the list for us to do. Yeah. And when you called Brian to say that there, there's a possibility of autographs? Yes. Oh, so during uh, library preparation is uh, very possible for oxidation to occur. And then there would be, cannot remember the context of the mutation. But it will be very dominant. So if you look at a Lego plot, it's very dominant. So what can remove that um, uh, artifact is something called an OxoG algorithm. It's developed by the Bro team. It's publicly available. And so we apply that to remove the artifacts. But since then, the Bro team also wrote a, a protocol, an experimental protocol, to add certain reagents into the library prep to avoid that kind of oxidation. Yes. How is the data anonymized or was it? It's pretty much anonymized in the sense that um, clinical data, we ask for specific um, uh, terms that are not identifiable. So we're not going to, we didn't ask for birthdays, for example. We would ask for age at the diagnosis. Um, and we don't ask for postal code. <laughs> so that's how I, that's, we piggyback on what ICGC has established, so that really helped. Yeah. yeah this is all ICGC data. This is all in the ICGC. It's our site. Yes. The question about the metadata, so yes. are these stored in the same location, like the same server? Is it like a giant spreadsheet, or how, how is it organized? So the metadata is indexed into Elasticsearch, so it's pretty much in a JSON format. Um, it's possible, and you can do reports and queries out of it. Yeah. Yes. So um, when the, uh, okay, so first off is that there was a change in policy by TCGA, by dbGaP, and also ICGC saying that, okay, 
we allow our members to put the data in the cloud. Um, but then for the ICGC portion, we actually had to go back to each data owner and asked if they will allow us to put it in Amazon. It was actually a very, very lengthy process because we made a request, they come back with a lot of questions. Okay, what are the implications? How safe is AWS? Do they abide by these rules? Sometimes they ask for ISO uh, certification. The lawyers have questions. They had to go through their REB again to make sure their uh, patient do consent this kind of environment for their data. It was a very lengthy process, and uh, it really took people like Lincoln Stein and Bath and Knoppers to and, and Tom Hudson to really negotiate with them. So eventually, uh, most of them came through. There were still other projects that didn't come through. Uh, China. Um, I believe a breast cancer project that spanned across multiple countries in Europe, so it was a little harder to get consent. Um, and then the German. So those are the ones that never then did, did not consent to putting the data in the cloud. Yeah. And and also one thing to point out is that ORCR is considered the custodian of the ICGC data, so we have a responsibility. And um, so we do have cyber insurance. And in order to get that cyber insurance, we actually had a threat, threat risk assessment of our system uh, before getting that insurance. So that involves getting a third party coming in to test the system, trying to break the system, and, and they do penetration testing, as they call it. Um, and eventually, we pass with flying colors. All right, thanks, everyone.